All right, guys. We're live here in the uh, Fellowship of Humanity in Oakland, California tonight. And I want to welcome everybody to the free Chelsea Manning rally in support of Chelsea. And uh, as you can see, everyone's here. We haven't quite gotten started yet. I'm just hanging out in the back. They've got some food and so forth, and everyone's just kind of getting settled in. I've just arrived myself, so I'm going to set up my uh, equipment piece by piece. I'm also trying to carry my helmet and find somewhere to put that too. That's uh, got to be safe where I go. You know? I just want to welcome those of you who are watching. And uh, let's see, should be a good show tonight. We should get some uh, good support. And I see uh, some people I recognize as well. So I think the uh, the audience is well packed. I think there's oh 50 to 100 people here already. Yeah, it's just by looking at the number of chairs put out. Yeah, there's at least maybe I'd say 100 people here already. So that's good. It's just great making some money. Now, uh, part of the reason we're here is a fundraiser to get support for Chelsea's hormone treatments, which are not being covered by the army that has her or him personally, you know, on, on lockdown. I'm not right, really sure, I guess, the, the correct nomenclature. But uh, this is someone who has you know, come forward and released information to WikiLeaks that's helped end the war in Iraq at the expense of uh, their personal freedom. And that's something that, of course, deserves to be recognized. Right. Again, I'm just going to try to find somewhere I can sit down. Freeman Sullivan, welcome. All right, got everything up and running. I'm gonna find somewhere out of the way to tuck my helmet. All right. And in a little while, we're gonna go around, we're gonna be talking to some people. Great, and I see a nice little spot out of the way. Hello. Hi. I'm gonna just put my helmet way in the back where no one will notice it. Uh, I'm the live streamer. A live streamer? Yeah, so we're here to give live coverage of this event, you know, to put out on the Oh, great, okay. I got in the way of the photo booth by accident when I was putting my camera away, <laughs> put my helmet away. So now I'm going to go find somewhere nice to, uh, to sit down. And then we've got some people we're going to be looking for tonight. Specifically, uh, we're told Daniel Ellsberg is going to be here, as well as Chelsea Manning's lawyer. And hopefully uh, my contact will find me soon. And we'll get these introductions. Oh, is your friend sitting here? I'm having trouble finding the spot. I get somewhere out of the way. Here we go. Get a nice spot in the corner. All right, sorry about that, guys. I just wanted to sit down somewhere so I could get a view of everybody that's here. And, uh, yeah, they're going to get started in just a minute this thing going. So I'm also going to set up my camera. If you'll give me just a second for that. Alright, 
So once again, we're here in Oakland to talk about the, the continued ongoing incarceration of Chelsea Manning. And there's a good crowd here tonight of activists and concerned citizens. Hopefully you guys can see in the background and the long-term solitary confinement. If you're familiar with the story, then you know that Manning has been incarcerated for the last uh, geez, it's been a few years now, I guess. Uh, this entire time in solitary, not allowed to talk to people, not even given community in the prison system, which you know, is pretty much, you know, I, I personally think that that's. Uh, form of torture in and of itself, but, you know, certainly it's difficult for anybody in that position, and so we're all here gathered tonight, I guess, these people who support Private Manning's actions to uh, expose injustices that were happening by the U.S. military, and he paid for that with his freedom. So tonight we're going to hear what they have to say, which is great. This is, uh, it's been a while since I've been at one of these, so it makes me happy. And I'm going to put the camera on. Again, I try really hard to stay out of the way of everybody when you're doing live streams. I've got my camera rig set up and stuff, so as you can see I've got some other equipment going on here as well. And again, it's just really important to try to stay inconspicuous as possible, just to not, not disrupt proceedings. Last time I, uh, I uh, did some photography at the Daniel Ellsberg event, and they complained that the, the camera was making noise, so I'm going to have to be extra respectful as uh, Mr. Ellsberg supposedly is coming tonight as well, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to interview him. All right, and I believe we're pretty much ready to roll. I think everything is uh, about to go, go down. I'm setting up my camera equipment. So, pretty much set. I'm just going to, uh, I think I'm going to move this camera onto the ground. It's a little bit safer. So, they said they start in two minutes, and of course, we're on San Francisco time, Bay Area time, which means it will happen in the next five minutes or so, I think closer. Uh, and yes, I think it is Chelsea Manning's lawyer. I'm not sure yet. He's been given a position uh, down there in the front, so. So hopefully we're going to be hearing from him, and then my plan is to talk to some of these people after the uh, after they speak. And oh, and I see Daniel Ellsberg's coming. He literally just passed right in front of me. So that's cool too. He's also taking a position in the front. I'm very glad to be uh, out of the way right now. That's cool, Patty. Patty says she uh, saw she saw him talk last night, and uh, 
yeah, he's uh, he's definitely a great great speaker. I'm really looking forward to hear what he has to say. I think this is going to be a good event. There's definitely a good turnout. Like I said, at least a hundred people here. And as soon as possible, I'm going to get my uh, the rest of my equipment ready to go here. So somebody's approaching the mic, looking very uh, ready to go. All right. Um, thanks. Thank you, everybody, for foregoing a, uh, a Christmas shopping evening uh, to be with us tonight. Uh, this event is hosted by Courage to Resist. Uh, Courage to Resist is an organization that supports people in the United States military that are having All right. trouble. Oh. Uh, with go. military law for reasons of conscience. So we have helped. Yeah. Yeah. Courage to Resist probably would not uh, uh, have started if not uh, for a very persistent uh, uh, activist that uh, David uh, Solnit in the back there. On his birthday, just the other day. Retirement uh, from activism uh, back in 2005 to support uh, Stephen Funk uh, from the Bay Area, who was the first uh, first person to refuse to fight in Iraq publicly. We did events right here in this hall. Uh, since then, we've helped hundreds of resistors. We've been involved in about 45 court marshals. Some court marshals go better than others for us. Um, right now, we have a young uh, woman, Kimberly Rivera who just uh, gave birth uh, while in prison in Miramar, San Diego, uh, currently separated from her uh, uh, like seven, seven day old uh, son, Matthew. Um, we're we're going to keep fighting until she gets out of prison. The good news is we do expect her to be released uh, in a week or so. Uh, so We've uh, helped a lot of people, um, and sometimes people are facing uh, months, 18 months, two years in prison. Uh, when I refused to fight in the Gulf War, I was facing uh, five years in prison. <laughs> but all of that uh, pretty, pretty much small potatoes uh, compared to uh, Chelsea Manning's uh, case that we've uh, worked on since uh, the summer of 2010 at a time. Uh, she was facing uh, the death penalty, a capital crime uh, for espionage-related charges. Um, I think most of you have been along for some of that ride over the last three year, three and a half years. Uh, we have uh, David Coombs, uh, Chelsea's attorney from the very beginning, uh, here to tell us, uh, kind of walk us through what happened at court martial and what's going on today and what we can do uh, now. Uh, after he speaks, uh, a warning, uh, we are going to ask uh, for your support, your financial support, to help us continue funding uh, those legal expenses. Otherwise, it would be like if we just simply uh, uh, abandoned her, and we're obviously not going to do that. Uh, before we do that, I want to introduce my uh, uh, co-conspirator in, uh, in this endeavor, uh, Farah, who's going to... Um, you have a few words from uh, what uh, how she perceived uh, the court martial in Maryland at uh, in, the, in the shadow of the NSA building. Uh, so I'll invite to uh, I'll invite Farah up. Um, during the court martial, um, I witnessed Chelsea sitting down 
this amazing young woman who is so strong and so powerful that was so inspiring for me as a woman as well. But just to see her there and you know sitting down in the, in the midst of the accusations that she's been receiving um, daily from the military um, prosecution team. She was accused of being a traitor. She was accused of being selfish and a hacker. In fact, what I found in reality was all these accusations literally apply to the United States military tyranny and the way, the way we're handling the case and handling the rights of the people in America and elsewhere, including people like in my country, Iraq. So tonight I am honored to introduce two people who were uh, present at the court martial but also have a long history of understanding the case of Chelsea Manning as well as cases of whistleblowers and the reality of what's happening in the United States in that regard. So uh, without further ado, I would like to first introduce Mr. Daniel Elsbeck. of wrongful U.S. interventions and the urgent need of patriotic whistleblowing. He was a member of the Private Management Support Network Advisory Board. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ellsberg. Thank you, Mark. I was struck that this is taking place in a humanist hall uh, how many humanists here tonight, by the way? Chelsea, I believe, described herself as a humanist in something that I've read. And also, this is Daniel Ellsberg. I believe the lawyer will be speaking. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, re I remember in the first spearing piece, essentially, uh, in the New York Times about her, uh, and her then Bradley, um, was uh, quoted somebody as saying, uh, a classmate who had known a woman who was classmate who in, in Crescent, Oklahoma. The New York Times said, uh, quoted her saying, he's very stubborn minded, he's very smart, very stubborn minded, very independent, won't budge, you know, from his opinion, just can't shake his opinion. That was part of the generally not very sympathetic picture they were giving. I happen to have read the, the, the remaining part of that quote in an earlier piece somewhere else. I know how it ended. It's a stubborn, wouldn't change it. For example, he believed in the theory of evolution. <laughs> <laughs> the Times time didn't see that. <laughs> you know, and, uh, it's the only one in present Oklahoma that had that great belief as well. Well, Joey Kane is here tonight as the Grand Marshal of the San Francisco Parade Rodeo, who nominated uh, <laughs> and nominated uh, and for uh, to be a Grand Marshal. And he was facing the, the question, I remember, Joey said, what is, uh, why do gays have to nominate? He's not a gay hero, so why do he's a gay hero? Joey's answer, if I can paraphrase pretty much, was A, he's a hero. The, we're all Americans, you know, we gays are also Americans, as Americans are proud of them, and uh, should be proud of them. And I know when I commented on that issue, uh, people asked me to, I was supporting it. They look, anybody can claim any identification, any membership in a group with this person uh, should be proud of it, and it's uh, his right to be proud of it. Uh, Oklahomans, although I don't expect uh, too much of them, somehow, uh, definitely gays. Uh, Army, Army, I, I wish he were a Marine like Jeff and me, I'd be proud of that. Uh, and uh, uh, gay, not, not trans, men, women. And as I, I remember saying, you know, as I appreciate that, short people should be proud of it. They've been denigrated quite a bit, you know, by Randy Newman and so forth. And so uh, there he is. 
he think at first, trust me, he was reading the um, uh, chat log with his um, uh, informer, uh, Adrian Ronald, saying, the, the statement saying, I don't mind so much uh, being, the thought of being imprisoned for life, or even be executed, which is some people thought when I was executed, you know, where did that come in? Well, of course, he was facing capital charges in the end. As a matter of fact, he was denounced as a traitor <coughs> for the well, not charged with it, but well, charged with some kind of a uh, army equivalent of it. And uh, again, the rest of that sentence was for, for tactical reasons at that time, at least, cut off, and didn't come out until later. The Wire magazine didn't put out the full quote until they're almost pressed to do it later. So, I would rather go to prison for life. I don't mind so much going to prison for life or even being executed. He said, but, but, uh, I don't remember the exact words, except for, I guess it was, except for having my picture painted all over the world, plastered all over the world as a boy. Right. Of course, that was the first indication when it finally came up uh, of his trans identity. But, uh, you know, interestingly, there is, of course, one of the most famous, iconic pictures, faces in the world today. So, in effect, before he was even tried, and it took him a long time to be tried, uh, for three years before he was tried, um, he was suffering his worst nightmare, right. actually, right? What he said to Adrian was, was his worst nightmare to him was worse than the idea of execution or going to prison. And uh, supposing he'd known that that would happen. Remember, this picture is appearing everywhere not because journalists have had an easy chance to interview him and take his picture, or video him, and so forth, um, as, for example, Snowden has had uh, more recently, uh, because no journalist has spoken to him. Am I wrong? I don't think there's been one journalistic interview with him in the more than three years now, almost four years since he's been in. Anyway, this was the fate, this was the punishment that he thought was the worst thing in the world for him, because it, it, uh, it went against his sense of his own identity, and who he was, he, that isn't who he wanted to be seen as, the, the way he felt. Would he have refrained from doing what he did if he had known that these posters would be everywhere in that picture? I don't believe it for a second. Yeah, I don't know, you wouldn't, you, you're the one who knows him. Uh, say you know well, uh, Bradley, Chelsea. Uh, by the way, did, did he ever use the name Chelsea with you or earlier? This is his lawyer. Uh, early on, I mean, early on. It's not an early name that he. Uh, but, um, uh, okay, so there is a fate worse than death that he saw. I have personally no doubt, without having been able to meet him, meet with him, that that would not have stopped him either at all. Am I wrong? What? Okay, good. So, uh, in other words, this was somebody that I personally felt great identity with because I said that was the way I felt 40 years ago. And I waited 40 years to hear somebody say that, basically. And I'll just mention to show what part of the pattern, well, two things. First of all, it's many people think that um, Snowden, has had the kind of debate in this country about the issues that Chelsea wanted to have, and to some extent achieved, but not, not nearly to the same extent that Snowden, uh, Snowden has now. My own personal uh, reason for that is, by the way, there is many people more, uh, of what of people in this room have regarded Chelsea as a hero from the beginning, but not so much in the larger society. A lot of supporters, but proportionately very small much larger, what's the difference? To me, the difference is that Chelsea was revealing crimes by Americans, by the government, to other people, the other side of the world, civilians, yes, babies, uh, torture, but to those people, to them, our enemies, or you know, people who were not us, and that didn't arouse a kind of movement that we're going to see with people trying to change the law in Congress now and so on. Because of course what Snowden revealed 
was what was being done to us here at home, everybody there. And that, unfortunately, not just because we're Americans, because we are humans, that gets people much more excited than uh, what they're participating in by science or whatever that's happening to other people elsewhere. But uh, the fact remains that when Snowden, two things about Snowden. First, when he was asked in his first interview uh, with Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald, uh, what influences had borne on him in the early days, he mentioned two people that he admired, were two people he knew. One was Danny Ellsberg, which was on a great, great honor to be, and Bradley Mann, Ellsberg and Mann. And if he had not studied closely what happened to Manning, while Colonel Combs was doing his very best to uh, get him out of these conditions, but when he studied what had happened to Manning, that's why Snowden is not in solitary right now and hasn't been for the minute. He saw that he had to do it differently. That as an American, he had to be outside the country to put this out. And of course, he's still commenting on it. He's free to do that. And he's been doing that because he was both inspired by and warned by the example of Bradley and Chelsea Manning. Uh, last thing I'm not going along with, I'm just really introducing Colonel Combs here, just mentioned that it so happens that two days ago, uh, I was coming back from D.C. and read on the airplane, just I couldn't tear my eyes away, from a galleys of a book that had been sent to me by its author, Betty Metzger, a uh, book called The Betrayal, uh, The Burglary, I'm sorry, The Burglary, not out yet. You'll all want to see this, uh, actually, when it gets out, an extremely gripping and inspiring book. It reveals for the first time the names of seven out of eight people who I had admired for 40 years, exactly, and no one that I knew in the movement, and it turns out from the book, no one outside of the eight people knew their names. And it was the names of people who had burglarized the FBI district office in Media, Pennsylvania. <laughs> exposed the FBI in a way they had never been exposed in their history and set the course for later revelations that led to the church committee and eventually to reforms that didn't work very well, but at least they were in the right idea, the intelligence oversight committees, which haven't worked, the FISA court and so forth. Anyway, things did happen as a result, but above all, for the first time, this hallowed American institution of the FBI was revealed to have conducted the kind of surveillance and for much the same purposes as the NSA is doing now, what Snowden is doing now. Now these people kept their mouths shut for 40 years. They didn't tell anybody. The FBI has never gotten on to them. The FBI is learning their names. For their, it was the number one case, absolutely, of course, having taken tens of thousands of files of the FBI and made them public at that time, revealing the surveillance of the black movements, the surveillance of the civil rights, and the surveillance of the anti-war movements, the Quakers, uh, everybody. And uh, uh, what is, uh, the reason I'm mentioning him in particular, though, is reading their initial interviews with them at, at last, after 40 years, it's as though you're each one of them, man and woman, you're listening to Chelsea Manning, Bradley Manning. These were people, each one of them, several of them had children. They didn't know when they got into that door where there was going to be armed FBI waiting for them. One person had left the group just days before they went in who knew everything. They didn't know what he was going to do. And when they went in the door, the guy was just waiting for the FBI looking on. Had they met the FBI or had they been found later, they would have gone to prison for as long as Chelsea had him will spend, and I, I hope that's shorter rather than longer, but it'll be a long time. And they consigned the care of their children to in-laws, siblings, if they didn't come home from that nighttime raid. They were very ordinary people, except extraordinary people who were doing something. They were not only doing something extraordinary, but the reasons they were doing it were like those of Chelsea, and what it came down to was we may be separated from our children, the ones who have children, 
spend life in prison, and that's what they were looking at, and that's what they would have been charged with. But somebody has to do this, and we don't know anybody else is going to do it, so we have to do it. This has to get out. What they were looking for was evidence of illegal surveillance to disciple dissent in this country and evidence of crimes by our government, and that's exactly what they did find it and put up. But had they not, and there might have been nothing there, they still were doing, they knew there might be nothing there. They were doing what they could at the cost of their lives, very possibly, because it needed to be done. It should be out. And that's the spirit, without having met him, that I sensed in, in Chelsea Manning, and I'd be surprised that Vernon Coombs doesn't confirm that, it's the one who knows that. But uh, that's why she has been my hero from the first words I've come out of her mouth, uh, her recent Thanksgiving message. Uh, if you haven't seen that, uh, do look it up. Very impressive. His thanks for being in a country where it's possible to learn these things about your government, to speak about them. You can say, possible? Well, look at her, you know, look at him. In, in prison, is that what you call possible? Well, the fact is that the word is out. He got it out, it couldn't stop him or her, and they never will. So I hope that in, in the light of that uh, Thanksgiving message, that we'll be hearing a lot more from her for the rest of her life. This country needs it. Thank you. later. Uh, another thing you can do, uh, be a volunteer at uh, Courage to Resist. Courage to Resist, uh, we've traveled the globe to uh, military court marshals uh, to support war resistors in Japan, in Germany, uh, and for me. Um, but we're located right here in Oakland, uh, next to uh, Kaiser, uh, down there on Piedmont. Uh, we could use your help uh, with stuffing envelopes, and uh, especially this week, uh, year-end uh, appeal. Um, so we can use your help uh, supporting uh, Chelsea and other uh, people of conscience who are facing uh, repercussions uh, for taking heroic acts. Alright, well, um, I'm also privileged and honored to uh, introduce our second speaker, Mr. David Coons. Um, I just want to share a little bit before I read his short bio. Well, his bio is actually long, but I made it short for tonight. Um, one of the amazing moments that um, I had, along with the many supporters who attended the court, was to see Mr. Coombs after the trial, after the court session was over. He, without hesitation, would come out and meet with the supporters, shake their hands, um, smile and talk, and answer all their questions. Um, he called everybody the Truth Brigaders, supporters because we wore our, in, our famous uh, truth t-shirts every day to court because the truth was present in the courtroom no matter what the prosecution team, <coughs> excuse me, team did or said. So Mr. Coombs is a civilian lawyer practicing military law and was the lead defense attorney in the private Manning trial this summer. He is currently representing private Manning in the clemency petition as well as the presidential pardon petition. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Coombs.
but for me, it, it hasn't. And I don't know if it will until Chelsea is actually out of prison. It is part of me. It's hard for me to, to really get my mind around everything I know to be the facts and the 35 year sentence. Because I believe then, and I still believe, that when Chelsea did what she did, she did an incredibly dangerous thing. What she dared to do was to show people the truth. Show people what was actually happening. And that is a very dangerous thing to do when your country does not want you to speak the truth. When your country wants you to just go along with what everyone believes to be the truth. And when Chelsea went to Iraq, she didn't go there with the mindset that I'm going to disclose any information. That was not her intent. Uh, she went there with the intent to help her unit. Um, as you know, she is a humanist. But she viewed her ability as an intelligence analyst and her belief in, in the intrinsic value of life to actually maybe help her unit save lives. And so prior to going, to deploying, this very dedicated woman started to read more, to learn about the country that she's going to, to learn about the people in that country, the, the long history. She can talk about Iraq and its history with the best of people. She became kind of the go-to person for the unit prior to their deployment. If you wanted to know something about Iraq, if you wanted to know something about the area they were going to, this young specialist, at the time actually a POC, um, she got promoted when she was deployed, knew more than uh, her superiors, her officers, about where they were going. This was the dedication that she had, and she had this dedication because she was hoping that she could apply that to actually save lives. That was her goal. That was her motivation. And when she got there, of course, she saw things um, that she couldn't ignore. And she talked about the fact that she her mind. She wished that she could just keep it on some dark server in some place, but she couldn't do that. And so Chelsea spoke out. She did that incredibly dangerous thing. And the real question that should be asked at the time she did that is, why was she the person doing this? You know, over a million people had access to the information that Chelsea ultimately disclosed. Think about that for a moment. Over a million people had access to that information. And yet nobody spoke out before this. And so Chelsea took it upon herself to do that at great risk and as we now know, personal sacrifice to herself. So she speaks out, and we know the information gets out, and it makes a difference. It makes a difference in this world. You think about it, just running off just some of the accomplishments from the release of this information. It ended the Iraq War. The government might not acknowledge that, but when Iraq saw the information that was released, that's when they insisted that they would have criminal jurisdiction over American soldiers. And that, of course, precipitated then our immediate withdrawal from Iraq. So had these documents not been released, we would have been in Iraq for a lot longer. So it ended that. Uh, it also shed a, a, a spotlight on the people that we're holding in Guantanamo. Many people, when they think about Guantanamo, think, you know, that is the worst of the worst. These are where we take the most dangerous terrorists that you could ever find and we put them there. They're so dangerous that we cannot bring them to the United States to allow them to be part of the federal judicial system where they would get due process actually get a day in court. They're too dangerous for that. 
So we need to keep them in Guantanamo. That was the mindset of most Americans. And unfortunately, um, most people believe that it was necessary. But these documents that Chelsea released showed that for the most part, the vast majority of these people were individuals who were just swept up for, at the time, was money that the America was paying for information on terrorists. And so someone would say, this person's a terrorist, they would get a little bit of money, that person would be gone. And who knows what the reason might be. It might just be for the money, or it might be these two individuals had some sort of disagreement or long-term problem with each other, and this is a quick way of getting rid of somebody. And those that weren't in that category were low-level operatives that were being held there at a cost of almost a million dollars a year per person. So the documents shed light on that. Uh, the documents also started Arab Spring. And again, the government doesn't want to give much credit for that. but. Tunisia would not have happened if not for these documents. And when you look at the ripple effect from Tunisia, you see that's just spread like a wildfire across the Middle East, bringing a chance at democracy to countries that um, we profess a desire to do that. But when we see now from the dip diplomatic cables, that was not our intent. And that's the other thing these documents did. They shed light on how we deal with other countries. And it's unfortunate, but we don't always do the right thing. We don't always deal with countries in what's in the best interest for the world. It's always what is in our best interest. And if you take it from the country level down to a, just normal people, if you knew somebody who was dealing with you this way, they would be known as a taker. Somebody who just takes, takes, and never gives back to you. And quickly, you probably wouldn't want to be friends with that person. That's how we were dealing with other countries on the international stage. And it shed light on that. And that's just a, a small list of how these documents change things. Now, of course, the government doesn't want to give any credit for that, and in fact, they wanted to instead exaggerate the potential harm from these documents. And they did this primarily out of embarrassment because these documents, in fact, embarrassed our country. So when the government started to go on the war path against Chelsea, at that time she wasn't identified, more so against WikiLeaks, the idea was convincing all of you and the rest of the American public how dangerous these documents were, how these documents would lead to the loss of, of human life, people who were cooperating with us. They would lead to the loss of soldiers' lives. It would aid the terrorists, because they would know our playbook of what we were trying to do. This is what was put out. I can tell you that not only through three years of this case, but even from your own standpoint of three years later, how many of those predictions came true? Absolutely none. The whole idea was to convince and control the narrative of these leaks are dangerous, you should not look at them. But these leaks were information, they were vital information that we should have had well in advance to Chelsea releasing the information. In addition to exaggerating the potential danger, the next thing they tried to do was to marginalize Chelsea. Marginalize the person who was giving this information out. And the way they did that was to say, you know what, she's a disgruntled soldier. This is why she released the information. She's a gay soldier. Didn't like, don't ask, don't tell. That is why she released this information. She has mental illness. She was mentally troubled. We knew she was mentally troubled. This is why she released the information. It's a standard playbook tactic. Kill the messenger when you can't kill the message. 
And that's exactly what they were trying to do, to show she must have been struggling from these various things. And make no mistake, Chelsea was struggling during that time. The thing she was struggling with was having a conscience. That's what she was struggling with. That's the illness that she was having difficulty reconciling. She had a conscience. She saw what she was reading. She saw what was happening. And she couldn't let that information stay inside. So that is why she chose to act and do the very dangerous thing of sharing this information with the American public. And that's what her intent was, to get this information out. She wanted to, to spark debates, to spark worldwide reforms. That's what she was hoping would happen. And early on, when you saw the collateral murder video, that's exactly what did happen. People started talking about that. What is going on? And she was greatly encouraged by that, by the discussion that had started. And as the subsequent releases happened, and when she was identified, then, unfortunately, some of that message got lost. And there is a harsh reality for people like Chelsea who are whistleblowers. And that harsh reality is that, unfortunately, within a short period of time, their conduct, their actions get forgotten. The message gets lost. And oftentimes, even though we know the information, we know what's happening, that also gets lost. People forget what they're told. They go on with their busy life. Some other event happens that the media takes its attention to, and the vast American public's attention gets directed to, towards that, then all the sacrifices of the whistleblower get lost, and they get forgotten. And now the question is, what happens now, today, going forward with Chelsea? Is she going to be forgotten? Are the lessons and the information that she shared with us going to be just a historical note that three years from now, five years from now, is forgotten. That's the question we have to ask ourselves. And I'll tell you one organization um, that I am very proud to be associated with is Courage to Resist. And for me, as... <laughs> me as a reserve lieutenant colonel, as a, a person who is still in the military, um, that might not have been the, the first thing out of my mouth three years ago. And in fact, when, when I was hired and I had my first conversation with Jeff, Jeff said, well, hey, you know, we're here to help. We want to help. Uh, we understand that you might not support us and what we're trying to do but we want to support you. And all we ask is that you don't say too many bad things about us when we're trying to help you. Which was very gracious of a joke, uh, I thought. And I told him at the time, you know, I, I don't know much about the organization, but I'm not going to badmouth the organization. And as time went on, the one thing that happened that consistently was always true was when I needed something for Chelsea, Courage to Resist was there. And so when they asked me to come here, well, that was too easy. It was my pleasure to come. But one thing I do want to, to highlight for a moment is when Courage to Resist stepped forward, that was at a very risky time to do that. Think back to the 2010 uh, time frame, late 2010. You had the President of the United States speaking out against uh, WikiLeaks and the leaks. You had people calling for the targeted assassination of Julian Assange. You had unprecedented amount of pressure placed upon corporate organizations to basically defund WikiLeaks. And now here you have a grassroots organization, Courage to Resist, stepping up saying, we're going to help. We're going to give you some money. We're going to do fundraising. We're going to do public awareness. At a time when that was not a popular thing to do. 
And I remember when that decision happened. I thought, you know, I don't know much about the organization, but what a brave organization to do that, to step forward at that time. And thank goodness that that organization did step forward because Chelsea was being worn down at that point. That's the other thing about most whistleblowers is they become isolated. And the United States government, with its unlimited resources, starts to bear down and isolate that person even further. And Chelsea had that not only from the standpoint of a monetary issue, was certainly not a very wealthy person, so she couldn't afford to just hire anybody, but also they did that pressure from the standpoint of where they placed her in Quantico. And that's a well-known uh, fact in history of how much uh, she went through during that time period, almost nine months. The fact that Courage to Resist stepped forward when they did made a huge difference. Uh, it led to, at the time, for me at least personally, the idea that, that I would not have to be totally pro bono in this case, which was, that's a good thing. My wife was happy about that. Um, but more importantly, when, when they stepped forward, it allowed Chelsea to know that she had support. And every time when we were in a hearing, Chelsea, uh, she would not look back, but she would ask me, how many people are there? Are they wearing the tree shirts? Um, she was very happy to know when certain people were there. She would recognize certain people. Um, I think this is part of her intelligence analyst thing. She would try to pick up information in a way that other people wouldn't recognize that she was getting information. So she was aware of certain people. Maybe you, by the way, she was aware. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, she also, uh, even today, is aware of what's happening. She called me yesterday right before the Santa Monica speech to wish me good luck, which that was nice of her, I thought. And uh, it might come as a surprise to you that she can call me. Um, she has a calling card and she's able to call certain people on her approved list uh, on one of those. So we talk at least probably three times a week. Um, but with her, as I said, the, the problem with the whistleblower is there comes a time where history moves on. And in this case, the, the stakes are too high to do that. It's too high because as of 2001, 7,678 soldiers have died in either Iraq or Afghanistan. These are men and women who committed the ultimate sacrifice for our country. These were husbands, wives, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. And what we don't know and what we'll never know is what could those 7,670 people have done in this world? What have we lost by the fact they're no longer here? We'll never know the answer to that question. But one thing that Chelsea has shown is that we need whistleblowers like her to ensure that when we do commit our nation's resources, we do so knowing all the facts. We do so knowing true information. And if war is a necessary evil, and assuming that fact to be true for this purposes here today, then we need to go into war when we know that this is our last choice, the last reason. Because 7,678 human lives, and that's just American soldiers, is too much to lose over lies, over incomplete truth. And that is why we need whistleblowers. Because too often in our country, we don't know information. Daniel talked about a little bit about Snowden and some of the facts that, uh, that have come out about Snowden and why people care about that, because now that's stuff that's affecting us. That's just one example of information that if you would have said that publicly maybe three or four years ago, or even 
even less time than that. People would look at you and say, no, our country's not doing that. So what else don't we know? And the answer to that is a lot. Because when you look at the problem in our society today, it centers on overclassification. We have a complete section of our government that is funded by us. That's classified. That we'll never know because we don't have the security clearance to know. By some estimates, we have over a billion documents classified at this point. As of 2012, we had over 97 million classification determinations during that year. It has a lot of information that is kept out of our public debate. And when you, when you see that, when you have that lack of transparency in a democratic government that prides itself on being the beacon of democracy for the entire world, you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with that picture? Why is there so much information that we don't know? So when Chelsea decided to release her information, again, she decided that this was stuff that the American public needed to know. And one little known fact about this, although I did bring this up during the trial, is Chelsea was selective in what she chose. She had the ability to release literally millions of documents. And the government kept pounding on the fact that it was over 700,000 documents. But those were very selective documents that she chose. And she released that information because she was hoping that it would spark debates. It would spark worldwide reforms. And now our challenge here today is, is our hope going to come to fruition? Are we going to have public debates? Are we going to demand accountability? Are we going to demand transparency in our government? I hope the answer to that is yes. Not only for the sake of my client and the sacrifice that she has committed, but also for future whistleblowers. Because if we don't pay attention to their sacrifices, how can we expect them to step forward in the future? And we need whistleblowers. We need them because there's just too much that we don't know. And I, for one, hope that we're up for that challenge uh, because uh, not being a, a person at the time that would be a person standing up for transparency in all avenues. Um, I look to what I've seen now in the last three years, and more importantly, I look to what you guys don't know, you people don't know from the case that happened in the closed sessions. And I think to myself, why don't you know that? There is nothing in there that you shouldn't have been able to see. So if you rise to the challenge, Hopefully we can encourage others to do so as well. And we can ensure that whistleblowers like Chelsea, like Snowden, like Daniel Ellsberg, and like the future whistleblowers, know that they have people who will support them, people who will stand up for them, and people who will be there when they need them.
because where I'm from, this is very warm weather outside. <laughs> and uh, I was enjoying that one. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw two men placing red and white crosses in the sand. And I remember not knowing for sure what they were doing. I do remember in my mind immediately getting kind of a visceral response of how poignant it was to have uh, those crosses being placed in the sand. And I walked up to him and I asked him, well, you know, what was he doing? And he explained to me the significance of that. Um, it stuck with me. I went back at lunchtime, essentially, to take a look at the completed memorial. And then I decided to give a, a totally different sp speech last night based upon what I saw. Um, I tell you that because then after that speech, I had a, a very lively, uh, probably close to hour Q&A period. And I know Jeff's going to say something here in a little bit, but um, I also look forward to that here. Um, if you have a question, I will answer. And uh, if we get kicked out of the building like we did last night, <laughs> I'll answer it outside. All right. <laughs> I would invite uh, my uh, steering committee uh, member, uh, Rainy Brightman. Come on up, Rainy. Uh, and in, in, uh, in the summer of 2010, we voted on a steering committee and we were stuck with it ever since. Uh, Bob Mule, also a member of uh, the five times. Basically, this is a fun pitch. Uh, you heard uh, Mr. Coombs. We need to continue supporting Mr. Coombs. Uh, support uh, Chelsea Manning. Uh, there's the clemency appeal in, in front of uh, General Buchanan. Uh, there's the presidential pardon on uh, President Obama's desk. Uh, there's the legal name change uh, Chelsea has asked uh, Mr. Coombs uh, to facilitate. He's all. Uh, Chelsea has also asked Mr. Combs to facilitate um, uh, travel uh, visits from his family. Uh, many of them uh, live in the uh, United Kingdom, and that takes money. And she's also asked us to help raise uh, tuition expenses so she could attend um, college classes uh, while uh, in Fort Leavenworth. Uh, Rainey uh, has already been uh, helping uh, us raise the money uh, quietly uh, amongst the crowd. She's going to share some of that. Hi there. Um, I'm Rainey Reitman, and I'm uh, super grateful to get to work with Jeff and be able to support uh, Chelsea and uh, work with so many activists here in San Francisco. And some of you got hit up for money by me personally as you were hanging out here. And one of them, Martin in the back, has agreed to make a matching donation of up to $2,000 from the crowd tonight, which means that if we are able to, among us, raise $2,000, we can really hit him in the checkbook tonight. <laughs> um, it did come, thank you, Martin. For those of you that don't know, Martin McCarroll is a amazing activist who is at every single Manning protest. Who is, I met him, actually, at a WikiLeaks protest three years ago uh, and is involved in ongoing actions against everything from tar sands to to Manning to other things, and it's a huge inspiration for me, and so I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to him. He had a string attached to this, which was that um, he would do that if I would put up $1,000 myself, which means that I, even though I work in a nonprofit, I'm going to be <laughs> matching the first $1,000, which means that I know we all come up here and we want to, we think to ourselves, God, Manning is just so amazing. What on earth could I possibly do that would ever be something like Chelsea Manning? And then we realize, oh wow, I can make her life easier. I can, I can do something. And maybe it's not easy for me. And maybe it's, maybe it's only the small amount. But uh, today, luckily, your small amount will be um, matched and then matched again. So I want to call on you guys to be brave in your donations. To think, uh, w what does this mean to me? How can I? make a difference today. And uh, uh, so that is what I wanted to say. I don't know if you have other things to say, Jeff. Well, it is the end of the year. Uh, this is the perfect time to make a tax deductible donation. Um, <laughs> amazingly enough, we expected the government to come after us. They haven't yet. 
Uh, we're waiting. Uh, so, still, you have the opportunity to make a tax deductible donation uh, for 2012, right? 13. 13. Yeah, 2013. Oh, um, since the summer of 2010, um, I got married. Uh, uh, I had a baby uh, that's the youngest person waddling around out here. Um, and uh, Chelsea Manning had a historic court martial. And I could never have done it without the help of our, my steering committee members, uh, Bob, Rainey, and also the staff. Um, Farah in the back, Mike over here, uh, Michael Thurman uh, over here, and they're going to be helping uh, pass the buckets tonight. Uh, checks uh, may not be encouraged to resist. Every check here will be applied to uh, the Manning Defense Fund against tax deductible. And uh, while we're passing those buckets around, um, we'll have a, a conversation uh, with Mr. David Coombs. One question about the... Could we also, in addition to giving you money, could we also give some money directly to Chelsea? I, I don't know the conditions under which, but I suspect they're not too favorable, but uh, I support some prisoners with, for instance, a subscription to the New York Times. It may not be our perfect example of we want a newspaper to be, but it's the best we got that deals on a national and international level. Mr. Coombs probably has the best answer for me for that, so I'll let him take that. Uh, giving money directly uh, to Chelsea, we can't make a, a money orders and send money orders directly to uh, her. Mr. Coombs. Yes. Yeah, on, on the issue of support, uh, Chelsea does have a inmate fund. The inmate fund can receive money orders or cashier's checks. The facility, for whatever reason, has a affinity for postal money orders. But um, she can receive those, and those can be used to buy comfort items. She can also use those to, to put money on her calling card, which enables her to call her family or friends. Um, and she can pretty much call almost at any time. Uh, which is very nice. So, uh, like I said, we talk frequently. Um, she has become good friends with my wife. Um, so, oftentimes, we'll get a call on, on my cell, and I, I see it's Chelsea. So, I pick up the phone and I say, Yes, Chelsea, how are you doing? And, uh, you know, what's going on? Is there something I need to help you with? And she's like, Oh, no, no, I just want to talk to your wife. Yeah. So, all right. <laughs> so, I hand the phone to my wife. Um, there was a time that we, some of you might know, where Chelsea, um, a little bit confused, put out a, a, a letter regarding an award that she received that Anne Wright accepted on her behalf. And I had to walk that back a little bit. Um, and I wasn't happy about the letter. And, and Chelsea and I talked about that. And her main concern was not so much whether I, I was upset with her, it was, was my wife upset with her? <laughs> so then uh, my wife said, no, it's fine. Uh, Chelsea seemed really good. So the funds that if you donated directly to her, you could just send them directly to the USDB, and that's how she would receive those. Um, and then obviously if you do that, the one disadvantage, I guess, is the tax deduction. Um, but if that's where you want your money to go, that's the easiest way to do, to do that. Does she have like a number? Um, like, sorry, just before I take another question, we have a microphone here, so if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand and I can take one. If we send her any money, does she have an inmate number that we Yeah, so if you go on both on, on my uh, website, um, you'll have that information. It's essentially just the way you would still write to her. All you need to do is write directly to her and and then have the money order in there. And that will be credited to her account. Microphone work, so if you have questions, microphone. And there won't be, like I said, there won't be a problem. Uh, I'll answer any question and all questions, so. Uh, well, I'd like to know her general situation and hormone treatment. And is there any chance of getting her transferred into a federal prison where she could get gender uh, transformation in medicine? Yeah. So on the hormone therapy issue, 
I am working with uh, two wonderful attorneys, um, one with the ACLU and one with the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center, both who specialize in transgender rights. Uh, so we are um, basically getting the war horse together um, in case the, the government doesn't do the right thing. Although I'm ca cautiously optimistic that they will in fact grant the hormone therapy request. I'm hoping to have some information on that shortly after the new year. Uh, I think the Department of Defense kind of recognizes the writing on the wall on this issue. It's recognized now as a standards of care issue for somebody with gender dysphoria. And this is really no different than somebody who has high blood pressure and they needed medication. You would not deny that to them because they're incarcerated. The hormone therapy is no different. With regards to the transfer to the federal prison system, um, that's not Chelsea's desire at this point. Um, and the sex reassignment surgery is not her desire at this point either. Uh, the facility that she's in to talk about her conditions, that, this is actually one of the things that most people don't realize, but the military system for a prison is a much different environment than what you might think of from a federal prison standpoint. Uh, it is filled with first-time offenders. So think about that for a moment. Everybody in prison, in a military prison, is a first-time offender. These are not your partner criminals. Secondly, because they're first-time offenders, they just want to do their time and get home. So they're not out to, to make somebody else's life difficult. And Chelsea's actually made friends, people are well aware of her and, uh, and what she, she was convicted of. Uh, she's had no issues. So for her, it's a, a very safe environment. And I will tell you, having toured the facility, uh, I joke with her about the fact that the gym that she gets to use is nicer than the one I paid for. So it's a nice facility, too. Um, so if she has to do time somewhere, this is a good place to do it. Uh, a date to circle on your calendar, though, is 2 February 2020. Uh, we don't get some relief uh, either through clemency matters with the community authority or through the president. That's the first time that she's eligible for parole. And even though that seems like a ways off, uh, I look at her and I think, how could that parole ever be denied? She is an excellent candidate for parole. She, when you look at the reasons for that, recidivism, She's not going to commit the offense again. She won't have access to classified information. <laughs> Check that box. Um, the next thing you worry about is safety of society. She's not a dangerous person. Uh, if anything, she cares. She's a humanist. Check that box. Um, then you look at support networks, support system. Does she have people who care about her who want, who want to step forward and make sure she, she succeeds? Yes, you can check that box. And then lastly, how does she uh, behave while incarcerated? She's been a model detainee. Um, if ever there was somebody who would have a right to uh, be a, a difficult detainee, it would have been Chelsea while she was at um, Quantico. I'm going to always say Guantanamo. I think that's understandable. I'm confused most of uh, But when she was at Quantico, uh, that was the time where she could have easily been a disruptive detainee, and she was not. So I'm hopeful that that date is the date that she'll be walking out, if not sooner. Hi. Um, I think you've already answered this question in part. Maybe you could say a little bit more. Uh, how has uh, Chelsea's uh, announcement of her identity changed her uh, or affected her day-to-day -day experience in prison? Yeah. And it, I will tell you that it, it's changed her from the standpoint of think about how difficult it would be. And let's just all put ourselves in Chelsea's shoes for a moment. You go into the military and you're gay during a don't ask, don't tell time period. So right out of the gate, you can't really truly be yourself, obviously. Then you go to Fort Drum, which is Fort Drum, New York, I'm very close to the Canadian border. There's not a lot around Fort Drum. So even going off post, everybody off post is basically a soldier. So you can't be yourself when you go off post either. And then you add to that the fact that she did have and, 
and does have gender dysphoria and couldn't really be herself there either. The announcement of her right after saying, I'm Chelsea, I want to be known as Chelsea, really came uh, not out of a desire to draw attention right after the trial, because that was the day after trial, the day after sentencing, if you remember. Really, the only reason that happened was because the facility said, based upon a question from Court Health, Court Health, excuse me, Courthouse News, um, when they asked, would you provide hormone therapy, there's some evidence that she has gender dysphoria. And the USDB said, flatly no, we would not do that. And so when they made that statement, and this was a couple days before the sentencing, then Chelsea and I sat down and we said, well, we're going to make this an issue. And I'm going to make sure that that answer changes. And it will change, either voluntarily or involuntarily. It'll change. So I think Chelsea feels much better at the fact that now she is Chelsea. Um, I do know, um, and Daniel talked about this, the photograph. This photograph actually was done by the defense team uh, because Chelsea wanted to have something that represented her at the time that was more so than the photograph of her graduating from basic training. And so we came up with that photograph. Um, I know that if Chelsea had her wishes, she would have a different photograph than this. Um, and it's unfortunate that we can't make that happen. Uh, although I do tell you that maybe in the near future, I have an idea uh, that uh, we'll see if it happens. Uh, but there's an artist that might be able to do a rendition of Chelsea the way she would like to see herself and like others to see her. So her making that announcement has really been a liberating thing for her. And now she's going through a discovery period of who she is, who she wants to project herself as. And uh, it's exciting because she's a good person. It's exciting to see her change. So the person with the mic is going to go with anyone. Oh, here you go. So I asked you this earlier, so sorry, you're going to have to hear it again. But we've heard this rhetoric surrounding the Snowden leaks that Glenn Greenwald and Ellen Rosberg of The Guardian have been putting forth that they have vetted these documents and that Snowden was very, very circumspect about what he chose to pass on. And there's almost this implicit uh, condemnation of Chelsea and trying to set up Glenn Greenwald and Snowden in a certain regard as good leakers versus Assange and Chelsea as bad leakers. And do you see any truth to this idea? And does this hurt a cause? And second, very brief question. I heard that when she was prohibited from exercising, she would dance to exercise. Is that true? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll take the easier one first and then go to the second one. The, the dancing, that was at Quantico. They prohibited exercise in her cell, and yet they made her stay in her cell 23 hours a day. So um, she started uh, basically trying to figure out what were the right and left boundaries of their rules. So it, clearly push-ups or anything like that was exercise. But dance, for whatever reason, the guards had no problem with. <laughs> so she decided, all right, I want to dance. And uh, there was a mirror in, in her cell. And she told me that uh, dancing to and watching her reflection was the most entertainment she had all day. So <laughs> that's what she would do. And oddly enough, they would write in their logs how this was odd behavior. <laughs> and I think if you put me in a uh, six by eight cell 23 hours a day, if the worst thing I do is dance in front of a mirror, then, you know, I'd be doing pretty good. So. Uh, with regards to the latter thing, that, that is a criticism. Uh, some people say Chelsea and WikiLeaks just dumped this information, it was dangerous, they didn't vet it. Um, but that really isn't the truth, because Chelsea did her vetting almost pre-leak. And when I say she had the ability to release a massive amount of information, she did. And she selectively chose what she released. So let me go through just a couple of those things. The SIGACs, the Significant Activity Reports, that made up the lion's share of this information. 
these are significant activities talking about something that happened at a particular time and place. When I was in Iraq, these SIGAC reports were basically known as BS reports for the most part because they were highly inaccurate. They were very, they were first hand reports on the ground. Most, most of the time they were not accurate. But even those times that they were accurate, it's important to note that this was something, talking about something that had happened with the enemy in the past. So the idea that this could give information to the enemy that was part of the event is laughable. And the I can't go into uh, some of the detail because uh, someone might say I'm releasing classified information. But I will tell you that I had the benefit of seeing the damage assessments for the SIGAP reports. And the classified report that I had to fight tooth and nail and discovery to get. I got them, I read them, and I thought, you know, this is not so bad. This is actually very good. They were honest in this report about how little this would have caused damage based upon uh, essentially how old the information was. So I wanted to enter that into evidence. Then when the government offered its witnesses to talk about the damage, the so-called experts who came and talked about how damaging this was to our country, in the closed sessions that none of you could be in. By the time they got done testifying, I realized that the damage assessments were more harmful to me than their testimony. In other words, the damage assessments were better evidence than the so-called expert's testimony. And I didn't enter the damage assessments into evidence. Uh, so that shows you how little that caused damage. The diplomatic cables clearly caused a lot of embarrassment I won't go into a long talk about how much of um, a stretch it was for our government to articulate harm. Uh, Secretary Gates, though, had a moment of clarity when he talked about um, the potential for long-term damage to our country for that. Uh, the Gitmo documents, again, a lot of embarrassment. Um, the things that Chelsea chose didn't need to be vetted. That's the difference. <laughs> So I look at what currently Snowden and Greenwald are doing. Obviously, they're putting out very important information that we should know. Uh, there is the counter argument of they're controlling when it comes out and what we receive. And if that is because of a vetting need, then that's a good thing that they're doing that. Uh, but I don't think that that puts Chelsea in the bad leaker category. Uh, nor do I think it puts WikiLeaks in the bad leaker category. So, who has a mic? Yes, thank you. Um, I just some standing so that we can familiarize ourselves <laughs> by sight. My name is Moises Montoyan, I'm a long term activist here. I'm also a public employee. And uh, thank you so much to uh, Critical Resistance. Um, my question, I'm not sure who to direct it to. So, um, basically, I was uh, overseas in October, and at least in Italy in particular, there was great concern about the ramifications of the uh, snow whistleblowing, um, and I think there was a lot of interest, and uh, it was on the mainstream media, and how those revelations affected Italians in their country as related to what this country is, uh, is doing. My question is, uh, maybe, um, Either you know, uh, Mr. Coombs or Bada, we've emphasized a lot the impact on the United States. I'm wondering, what do Iraqis perhaps today, or maybe to start with, perhaps what Iraqi citizens may have um, felt, or how they responded to, at the time, Bradley Manning's revelations, and today, as your, one of your points towards the end of your speech, was that we don't want to forget and we want to continue to support whistleblowers and Chelsea in particular. Today maybe, do, do Iraqis, are they uh, informed or interested and, or do they remember what, what the importance of all this was in relation to where they're at today? Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just, I, I can answer from my perspective, I think from the significant activity reports, as I said in my speech, that made a difference for Iraq and whether or not they would agree to the status of forces agreement that would say they had no criminal uh, jurisdiction over our soldiers. 
So I think the SIG Act's made a difference there. Uh, I also think um, through uh, various organizations that were trying to keep track of the amount of civilian deaths in Iraq, uh, the SIG Acts were incredible information. Um, and that information sometimes helped Iraqi families find out what happened to their loved ones. So that was also important information. Um, that's how I've seen it impact them. And then I think also the diplomatic cables certainly gave a lot of countries insight into any sort of uh, duplicative type of dealings that we might have had and whether or not we were always being up front and, uh, and respectful, I guess, in, in our dealing with other countries. Thank you. Thank you for your service for the last three years. Stop. I, don't, I don't think your mic's on. There you go. Juan, thank you for your service for the last three years. Thank you. I'm, I'm interested in uh, your perspective of the military justice system, particularly that's changed the last three years, your assessment, reflections. Yeah, so I had a, a person ask me last night about this, thinking that I would say, you know what, uh, it was a, the military justice system is not fair, it was a, a farce of a trial, and that would be my position. And that isn't my position. Uh, would I like to have won uh, some of the motions? Yes, I would have. Uh, do I think the outcome in the trial is fair? No, I do not. Um, but it, it did confirm for me that the military justice system uh, is still the fairest system that we have in our country. And I say this um, from having a ability to practice both in state, federal, and military. I still believe the outcome for Chelsea was by far, even though I don't think it's fair, she would have fared worse in a federal system. She would have gotten life in prison. I'm almost confident of that. Uh, and the reason why I think in the federal system, the you have, even though the sentencing guidelines are no longer necessarily binding, you have a, a belief in, in those as being the appropriate outcome. And you can do a little research as to individuals charged with far less than Chelsea and their outcome. Um, I initially tried to do that kind of as a comparative in advance of the trial to see, could I make an argument, sensing argument that, wait a second, you know, the government is asking for X, but in the federal system, you know, a similar, similar charged person would receive Y, something far less. Mm -hmm. I didn't make that argument because the evidence didn't support that. Uh, it was just the opposite. Uh, so the, for me, the way it's changed my mindset, though, a little bit, is there are too many rules that favor the government. Um, I have to go to the government to get expert witnesses funded. I have to ask the government for witnesses and justify why. Um, there was never a, a doubt in my mind that we should go with a judge as opposed to a panel. Uh, the fact that the government moved the case to Fort Meade, where NSA's headquarters are, um, where everybody there has a security clearance and arguably could be viewed as a victim of Chelsea's decision, um, that made it easier to say I'm going judge alone as opposed to a panel. Um, are there things I would change? Yes, and the number one thing I would change and the thing for me that really drove home of what needs to change in our system is we need cameras in the courtroom. We need to have, we need to have the American public be able to see what's happening on a daily basis. Uh, you know, Rainey was up here a little earlier. Her organization did a huge service to us by giving us at least a verbatim record of trial within a day of the events happening. And I'll tell you that was wonderful from the standpoint of allowing people to see for themselves and not rely upon the journalist's interpretation of what happened. Uh, to be able to read what happened in that, the courtroom that day. Uh, but 
from my standpoint, it enabled me to have a transcript in which I could use to impeach other witnesses. Um, so it was a wonderful uh, tool for me. Um, but it shouldn't have been a tool that they had to do because we had cameras in the courtroom. Uh, everyone could have seen and made an independent judgment at that point. And I think cameras would have impacted what the military did because now it's not just the passive people watching. It's it more than likely you would have had CNN. Um, Nancy Grace would have been there, I'm sure, to say a live report me. Um, you know, she's always looking for some trial to cover. Uh, not having the uh, cameras made it hard to get media's attention because it was hard work. And that's why you had the Lex O'Briens, the Kevin Gustola, that were making a difference by covering the trial and other people who didn't have the wherewithal to do it. What was the, what was the process of you becoming supposed uh, selected as Kelsey's counsel? Yeah, so I, like the most of you, saw the collateral murder video and uh, I, had, I was actually having a dinner party at my house and uh, some people said, oh, did you see this video? I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, it just came out, so they showed the video, and they wanted my impressions of it because I'm military. And I look at the video, and I've taught rules of engagement, rule of law. I taught that. And I looked at this, and I, I saw a rule of law violation. Uh, it was incredible for me to see that. And I, I, I thought to myself, I wonder how this got out. And of course, a, a short while later, uh, Chelsea was arrested. And I remember again talking to a, a friend saying, wow, you know, that's, um, that's going to be a tough case. I wonder who's going to get that case. <laughs> um, because uh, everybody had already piled on. You know, you had uh, Secretary Clinton, President Obama, you had a lot of people calling for uh, Chelsea to to basically be executed as a traitor. So then I get this call. Um, I'm at home and I pick up the phone and, and there's a person, Captain Paul Bouchard, who was one of the first and began the trial, one of the defense counsel. And he calls me up and he says, I have a person who would like to speak to you. Uh, that person's name is Bradley Lynn. And I immediately recognized the name. I knew who the person was. So we started to talk. We spoke on the phone for about an hour, and Bradley, now Chelsea, was essentially trying to figure out who she wanted to represent her. Um, so she spoke to me for about an hour. I answered all of her questions. Um, she asked me a couple things, like one, would I play it to the media? She didn't want that. And I told her um, I would go to the media if there was something that I felt was in her best interest, but otherwise that wasn't my desire. Uh, so she liked that. Um, and then she just asked me if I would have a problem as a reserve lieutenant colonel representing her and what she did. And I told her no, I wouldn't. So uh, probably then, maybe a week later, her aunt called me to say, hey, we would like, Chelsea's told me, uh, we'd like to hire you. And we'd like to know what your retainer will be because some of the other people they spoke to were somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere from three to six hundred thousand dollars to to represent her. And you know, I I said, well, I'm not going to be anywhere near that. Um, you know, it, and this is not a situation where I felt like you got me paid for. Uh, I would do it in almost kind of a pro bono aspect, hoping that um, I could do a good job for. Her. So that's how she hired me. That's how I got involved in the case. And initially, I thought, you know, what? this is this is going to be a case that's going to last probably six months to eight months. And uh, three years later, uh, you know, we finally got the case done. Hello. Um, so, I do lots of events, fundraisers, little ones, big ones, some ones bigger than this, sometimes smaller than this. We raise about $500 each time. 
So I was kind of hoping we would make a little bit more of this money and I, this time, and I was really hoping that people would dig deep. And um, uh, Martin, as I said, uh, donated $2,000, and I, uh, I matched it with $1,000, uh, all of which was matching $3,950 from the crowd tonight, which puts us at an amazing $6,950. Please give yourself a round of applause. You guys are heroes. Thank you. Um, that's amazing. So thank, thank you guys for doing that. Thank you guys for making that possible. I really hope we get another $50 so that we can save the base $7,000. So if anybody's got like $50 that they're like, oh darn, I really didn't need this, or maybe I was going to buy something, but I don't need it now, $50 would get us the $7,000, which is a much easier tweet I would just throw out there. So, but all of that aside, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Everyone thanks you. We, uh, you know, we're not in the front of the news anymore, and so it's a lot harder to make ends meet, to make the bills. and. We don't want to abandon Chelsea at this really important moment. So thank you so much. I, you are showing uh, bravery in your donations tonight. Thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. I think that you're going to have to bow out on me. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your really hard work and presentation tonight. Um, I have two questions. Um, can you just say more about the legal strategy now, um, like the timing of it, just a bit more specifically? Because we're the women down here that have to keep this spotlight on Thank everyone for Jesse. watching. And um, it would be really uh, useful to, to know how like, to see that. And the second question I have is something that I work with Spirit Squad, and we keep struggling with what we're putting out on our email. And I wanted to know if Chelsea calls herself transgender or not. Yeah, maybe I'm not talking some more. So uh, the easy one, uh, Chelsea does consider herself transgender. Uh, and with me, I, I didn't know a lot about transgender. Uh, so I say transgender, and she corrected me and said, no, it's just transgender. And so I said, all right, transgender. Um, but since then, I learned quite a bit. Um, a lot of that is to uh, you know, the benefit of having ACLU and SPLC helping me through this process. Uh, so I've, I've now become a little bit more of an expert on that, especially with uh, treatment of individuals who are incarcerated that have um, transgender issues. So yes, she considers herself as that. The second question, which is a little more difficult, is you know, what are, what's the strategy? What, are, what am I trying to do going forward? Well, I think it's it's clear that we're trying to ensure that she gets the appropriate medical care. And uh, a person asked me before, why aren't you out, you know, talking to anybody that'll have you on television about this issue? Why aren't you doing that? Um, and the reason why is, unfortunately, when you are part of a system, there there are ways that you can make the system do things. And if being out right now in the media would cause them to do the right thing, that's what I would do. But for me, I think trying to work within the system right now, at least until they give me an answer, is the better course of action. And what we've been successful in doing is getting them to do a global assessment of Chelsea. Uh, they confirm the gender dysphoria. Uh, we have not only the confirmation of that, but then I educated and provided documentation to the facility on standards of care within the federal system and how they recognize the hormone therapy as a standard of care issue. So I, again, hope that the right people will do the right thing. And if they don't, then they'll obviously become, there'll come a time where playing within the rules is not to the benefit of Chelsea. And then you will see my face um, out there bringing this issue to the forefront. And we'll be doing it not only by a public awareness aspect, but through litigation. 